burger is. You want this? You'll never cut the mustard, mean winner! Food fight! Welcome to Amusing Jews, where we celebrate Jewish contributors and contributions to American popular culture. I'm Jonathan Friedman. And I'm Joey Angelfield. Producer engineer Mike Tomrin is working somewhere behind the scenes. Amusing Jews is a project of Adat Chavarin, Congregation for Humanistic Judaism, the Jewish Museum of the American West, and Atheist United Studios. Hey, Joey. Graphic memoirs, which use comics to tell autobiographical stories, were largely pioneered by Jewish artists and writers like Aileen Kaminsky Crum, Harvey Pekar, and Art Spiegelman. Many of the stories of these Jewish creators have been expressly Jewish, presenting memories and histories in raw and unvarnished detail. A new book by today's guest, from a new generation of graphic storytellers, furthers this legacy in bold, uninhibited, and innovative ways. We're excited to talk with Ari Richter, a visual artist and comics creator who's a professor of fine arts at LaGuardia Community College in the City University of New York. His debut graphic memoir, Never Again Will I Visit Auschwitz, a graphic family memoir of trauma and inheritance, was recently published by Fantagraphics. Ari, welcome to Amusing Jews. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. You open your book, Never Again Will I Visit Auschwitz, with a look into your childhood in Tampa, Florida during the 1990s. You were the token Jew in your public school and attended Jewish Sunday school with what you call some of the waspiest Jews who ever dared to assimilate. How did this upbringing inform your developing Jewish identity? Well, you know, it gave me something to compare myself against or to kind of grow you know, <laughs> in relation to, but that was, for me, that was the norm, you know, it's like a, it, it was a, it was a place, I mean, Florida is a very kind of like a sporty place to start with. And, you know, Jews as the diaspora goes to different, you know, parts of the world, they sort of adapt to their environs. And, but I, you know, I, I never really felt like I fit in there and, you know, went to Sunday school. I, you know, was very, in, you know, my parent, my family was very involved in the synagogue. My grandfather was a, like the auxiliary rabbi there, uh, retired, but I, I, so I had a lot of, you know, uh, I, I did a lot in the community, but I, I just, I never quite felt like I fit in or connected. And, um, you know, it really wasn't until I got to New York city that I sort of found my, uh, my mishpucha in the, uh, in the grander sense. So one of the things I really appreciate in your book are the drawings of artifacts of your youth. Uh, we're from the same era, and your delightful depictions of early 90s comic books like Flaming Carrot, The Tick, and Madman, oddball action figures like Food Fighters and the Real Ghostbusters, sports cards and Garbage Pail Kids warm the cockles of my heart. I've noticed that a collecting impulse is sometimes pronounced among descendants of Holocaust survivors, including you and me, and of course, Jonathan Safran Forer, as demonstrated in Everything is Illuminated. What's at the root of your collecting habits? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly think that there's something there about a trauma response, you know, that's this, this idea that, you know, that being able to control our environment and the things in our environment is, a, is, is an important way to kind of take back that, that, that 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 trauma that's been that's been that's been you know put upon somebody but i um i, I can definitely attribute it to like my grandparents who were survivors who my grandfather was like a, a a huge hoarder and you know i mean part of that was also just growing up in uh you know the great depression uh in general that there's something generationally about you know uh, wanting to make sure you save every little thing going to the flea market and just uh, you know pulling every you know piece of junk into your home but yeah, I mean, it's there's something about uh, just wanting to just amass things, and I think it's the same impulse that um, that that is you know it encourages you know survivors and their descendants to talk about their experience and to kind of like collect the the stories themselves. So to write this this write these stories down, which so many people in my family did as well. I really think that there is something that you know connects those those habits together. Yeah. I mean, part of me wonders why I've kept my food fighters action figures over the years, moving from place to place. And like, they, 
they just come with me, these obscure toys, which are really beautifully designed, actually. But, you know, another part of me realizes that I think, like you're saying, to cope with migration and uncertainty, we hold on to things that maybe are irrational or don't make sense to others. But to us, there's it's almost intuitive that we would keep these things. Right. And I think you use the word like artifacts of, of childhood as well. And I think that's a really great way to describe what those things that we carry around with us, you know, represent. And it, it really is like a way of kind of uh, encapsulating memories into into objects. And, uh, and you know, it also, you know, for me, beyond toy collecting and, and this kind of thing, I like as a as an artist, I kind of use that as a flimsy premise to just things in my art studio, you know, because it's like this like extra space. It's this other place where that kind of, you know, collecting behavior, you know, is not seen as like, like problematic or weird or, you know, or hoarding because it's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm collecting materials for future art making. Yeah. I know that, uh, artists of older generations would keep their morgue files of images that they would cut out for magazines and, you know, old books and things like that. I know that we don't necessarily need that anymore in the digital age, but you're saying that the physical objects are still kind of excusable as art objects for your purposes. Yeah, and I mean, I I just I mean in my in my kind of like pre comics life as an artist, which has been like a really big change for me creatively in the past five plus years that I've been working on this book. Um, but you know, in my studio, I have like flat files just full of like like animal hair and, and human hair and uh, ma- like jars of nail clippings that I've collected for myself over the years and uh, um, and my own skin in the, in the freezer and those little vials. Like I have like, you know, like like if it, outside of like, you know, somebody who calls himself an artist, if anybody else were to, you know, stumble upon these collections of things, it might be, you know, like kind of worrisome to, uh, <laughs> you know, or it's like, well, that explains why, you know, we killed, you know, 500 people or whatever. And I think, would you keep the uh, skin jars and stuff if you weren't an artist? Were you doing that already? It's a, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. I, I mean, I think that there's definitely like a little bit of like a sort of like general OCD sort of tendencies at, at, at play undiagnosed. Um, uh, that, you know, I'd been kind of collect, like when I was a kid, I used to collect like dried worms that I'd find on the floor to sidewalks and, uh, you know, and stuff like that. And like, you know, bugs and all these kind of things. But, um, I, you know, it's a, as a working as a fine artist, I, you know, would just kind of look around my environment for materials. So it would be like, you know, like, well, you know, I, I know I keep growing fingernails and hair and skin. So these are things that I have access to that I can you that I can remove from myself and then manipulate in certain ways to create art objects. Your art is is sort of inclusive. Your illustrations include an assortment of frenetic drawings, scanned documents, photo reference material, and other media. Who inspired your style? You know, I come at this project not as a like a, an illustrator or like a cartoonist and like a trained sense. I mean, you know, people study, you know, they go to school for these things or study their, you know, their whole lives professionally to be these things. I came about this from kind of like a side angle as like a, you know, as kind of a trained drawing, painting, sculpture oriented fine artist. So, you know, my particular skill set that I have is not the kind of like cartoonist skill set of you know, be, making consistent imagery that, you know, continues from one frame to the next, to the next, to the next. And you can tell from the beginning of the book, to the end of the book, that stylistically it's the same. And this character, you know, reads the same way from one place to another. Like I, it's, it's almost, you know, I'd say in some ways, the training as a, as a fine artist is almost the opposite spectrum, all sense of a spectrum from training as an illustrator, where instead of being trained to get that consistency, you're trained to kind of as an, as a fine artist to grab at sort of like immediacy and like like kind of like emotional rendering versus uh you know a more stylized uh you know rendering as i described so for me that the idea that each chapter i could kind of like start like a blank slate and that each chapter would have a different visual reference point um that i can then you know riff on so that i'm i'm not you know, con- so concerned with like, you know, having that perfect consistency from, from chapter to chapter. Um, but just as an artist in general, I have, I've always gravitated toward collage. Collage has been a 
as like a sketching medium for me has always been very important no matter what sort of medium I'm working in. So for me, like like using using collage as a organizing principle of this book was second nature. So, you know, yeah, there is some like physical collage examples, like things are literally like, you know, like pasted together, you know, images of, uh, you know, different, different things together, but also the working process was like a collaging process where I would always kind of like start with some reference photos, maybe, uh, that I would sort of like draw over, manipulate over, like add other elements in and you just have my, my, everything was made in Photoshop. So I'd have these Photoshop documents that have like 50 layers of them or like hundred layers of them, some of them. And, uh, and each of them just like a collaging, collaging, building, building, uh, and manipulating of these different, uh, you know, all these different images together. But, but back to that, you know, that question about the different, the different styles and kind of giving myself the, you know, allowing myself to, uh, um, kind of like make art in different aesthetic ways. Uh, again, each chapter had like a different sort of aesthetic reference point, like that early chapter, the the first chapter about growing up as a kid in Tampa, Florida, I wanted to be sort of like more child inspired and kind of like breezy aesthetic. So things I was thinking about was like the, um, I was thinking about like the Sunday funnies and like uh, kind of comic strips from, from the newspaper and these kind of things I would be like reading as a kid, um, you know, also like, you know, comics like The Tick or, you know, Madman or Flaming Carrot, stuff like that. And so, so that was like a guiding principle for me with that chapter, that was a little bit of like a, you know, like breezier chapter as far as the, um, as far as the, the, the content goes. And then, you know, like the chapter of like my great grandfather, uh, Richard May in turn and Buch involved, for instance, you know, that was like a lot more, you know, a lot more serious topic wise. And I also just aesthetically wanted to go for something that was more of a painterly aesthetic. So I was thinking about German expressionist painting, which would have been something roughly contemporaneous to my great grandfather's experience in like Weimar era Germany. Um, and, and then just, you know, but all of course, uh, you know, I still, you know, I'm not like some like perfect mimic of styles. It's all still filtered through my own, you know, interpretive lens. Um, but yeah, the, you know, that chapter and then the, uh, um, um, the one with my Richter grandparents, the my, the rabbi and, and his wife, um, you know, that one was a lot more kind of like photographically oriented. So that that's one where I did like significantly more like photo reference work. It's interesting that you're mentioning your coming at comics from a fine arts perspective. Uh, that's very similar to Aileen Kaminsky Crumb, actually. And I see some of her work in your work, I don't know if you're a fan or not, but, you know, she also came from a German expressionist kind of um, background and really ex described herself as an expressionist comic books creator. And she also, you know, changed the the look, changed the characterizations herself. She would look different in every story that she would create. You know, there's that kind of fluidity and flexibility, I think, from the the more emotional style that you're describing as opposed to you know, the Charles Schultz or whoever we're expecting to draw the same every time, you know? Right. And yeah, and Crumb, Crum, you know, uh, is, is a great influence. She was an amazing, uh, you know, amazing artist. And yeah, I did love for the expressiveness of her, of her work, the, the use of color and the use of line and that, that, you know, not worrying about, yeah, not worrying about that visual continuity in the same way. I mean, you know, you have, it, it only, it, it can stretch only so far because if you're, you know, it, 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 graphic, you know, uh, storytelling, you know, there has to be some amount of consistency there or else you're going to just lose your reader. You know, it's like, wait, who am I, who, who was I just listening to in that panel? They're just talking here now. And like, I'm just, you know, confused. So there has to be, you know, some level of consistency, but then to be able to play around, you know, within those parameters. And someone else who I would mention in that conversation would be Harvey Picard. And uh, even though he was not an illustrator himself, the fact that he had different illustrators for each of his short, you know, story segments was just like such an amazing, I, I think an innovation on his part. Cause it's like the same, the singular voice and it's unmistakable, the, you know, the Picard voice, but then having that mutated and being interpreted by different artists. So I kind of saw myself as like, it was like my own, you know, American Splendor style anthology. The other thing I like about your work and uh, some of the depictions of Picard and certainly Kaminsky Crumb is there's sort of a, th there's not an impulse or a need to make everything pretty. You know, there's an ugliness to it, which I really like. And I 
don't mean this in any denigrating way. I think there's something really compelling and aesthetically important about like crude illustration as well. And you you pull that off and it's sophisticated. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. And I, I mean, like, I thank you. And I, you know, I, I've always as an artist, uh, you know, uh, gravitated toward the grotesque and the abject. I mean, you know, like earlier, especially in my, in my you know, artistic life, the grotesque, you know, thinking about these like food fighter action figures and the, you know, the kind of like, you know, milk and cheese comics and stuff. That's just kind of like, you know, like that, that's always kind of like, you know, I was like, as a, my earliest interest in creativity, like my earliest, yeah, I would say like examples of art making were these like collages I used to make as like a five-year-old of like peeling the worms off the sidewalk on flipping forward and like making, you know, collages of these worms. So like I've, I've always gravitated toward that, yeah, grotesque, the yeah, abject, but you know, when you're, when you're talking about a subject matter, like the Holocaust, you know, I, I think there's plenty of room for those, uh, you know, for those aesthetics to be there. It's like, I mean, if you're making something that's like just fully dwelling on, you know, the merits of beauty in relation to the Holocaust, you're maybe doing it wrong. But, um, I, I, but, you know, especially I think an example I could give is the, uh, the chapter, especially about my grandfather, uh, Jack Honig, who, uh, grew up as a child in, um, rural Southwestern Rhineland, Palatinate Germany, uh, was kind of like very like bullied, had this like, you know, like the, the earlier part of that chapter, those three chapters of him, you know, like I almost was like starting with that, like Sunday funnies aesthetic, but then like mutating it through this like grotesque lens, almost more like the garbage pale kids version of, you know, Charles Schultz. Um, and then, but then his own story, like, you know, the, the moral ambiguity of the story of this, of this child refugee who ends up, you know, uh, go, escaping Germany before the war on a child transport, loses his mother and his grandmother, um, in the Holocaust, and then come, ends up in the United States as a, like, you know, old teenager, and then immediately enlists in the U S army to go back and fight in Germany and like goes back to his hometown to like settle some old scores and these kind of things. So the moral ambiguity of those stories like lends itself as well to that, that we kind of like grotesque reading. That's where I'm, I was very much thinking about influenced by uh, like German Dada artists like uh, George Gross or Otto Dix and just these kind of like, just kind of like mutated people, like the kind of like the aesthetics that someone like uh Art Spiegelman would have been probably looking at or thinking about with his original Garbage Pail Kids uh, trading cards. Well, speaking of Spiegelman, it's probably inevitable that your book will be compared to Mouse, Art Spiegelman's graphic memoir about his Holocaust survivor parents. I recently read an old State of the Comic Field article by Harvey P. Carr, a blessed memory, in which he commended Spiegelman's recounting of his relationship with his parents and their harrowing experiences, but felt the comic wasn't real enough because he chose to portray human beings as non-human animals. We could debate that assessment, but perhaps it would take someone like you, a grandchild of survivors, to have the distance to create more direct depictions of those unspeakable horrors and how you've grappled with them. Where does your book fall in the subgenre of Holocaust graphic memoirs. Yeah, I, I, I really, I mean, clearly Spiegelman has been like a guiding, you know, light for me, you know, through this whole project journey. I mean, actually, you know, discovering Mouse in my Grandpa Jack's like Holocaust library, vast Holocaust library as a child, maybe as like a 10 or 11 year old, and like reading this as a comic success kid, it blew my mind. I'd never seen anything like that. And, you know, it wasn't until, you know, you know, decades later that I really, you know, read more in the graphic literature vein. But, um, uh, you know, so I, I definitely owe a lot to what he, what he started there. Um, but there, you know, it, his, his book was a particular generational perspective. And as you're saying, you know, he was a second, second gen, uh, you know, creator, uh, you know, making work, you know, about his parents and their experience and, you know, so much more, you know, he was so much more wrapped up in it. And, you uh, Especially since his, uh, you know, his, his father was still alive too, while he was, you know, at least you know, the, while he was creating the first part of the book, and, um, you know, I don't, I definitely would not have been able to make this book while my grandparents were still alive. I, I just don't think I would have felt the, I wouldn't have had like the 
even like the self permission to do it at that point. Cause they're just, you know, feeling too close to the subject. You know, I, I kick myself constantly for not having asked them more questions, you know, that could help fill in the details and get the story straight and this kind of thing while they were alive. But, you know, uh, anything you can, you know, like figure out in, in hindsight that way. But with, um, you know, I, I, with with my book, I think something that was actually really important for me, you know, beyond the, you know, like whether I, you know, make these into like human characters or anthropomorphic animal characters, um, you know, like for me, what was actually really important was bringing in like a full sense of color into the world of the comic, because, you know, there's some of the, you know, some of the greatest like works about the Holocaust from Mouse to Schindler's List. Uh, you know, are in black and white. And there's something about that that I feel really historicizes the the subject in a way that, you know, I, I, I don't know if future generations are going to be able to really fully connect, you know, with, with work that's, you know, not in the kind of the bright technicolor of, uh, you know, the internet and, uh, and, and the kind of the digital world that we live in now. So, so for me, that was like a very specific decision that I made to kind of like use color to make it kind of like feel more, more real to, to that, to lived experience in that way that we, that we have today. But, uh, but, you know, again, being a third generation, uh, you know, removed from, from the Holocaust and from the survivors themselves, you know, has, you know, it, it gives me both a little bit more, I think, license creatively to experiment and to, Kind of just, but also to tell the story uh, through my lens and through my perspective. A lot, a lot's changed in forty years since you know the since since the bulk of Mouse was was created in the world, um, and even more has changed in the past eighty years since Auschwitz was liberated. Start you know come this next uh, next January. So um, you know I, I think that it's there. Each generation is going to have something you know important to add to the conversation. But of course, I I sit firmly on the shoulders of giants. So I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I absolutely, and that's why something that was actually really fun and important for me to do in, in this book was to um, create a bibliography at the end where I not just talk about some of like the more academic sources that I, that I looked at, you know, like, uh, you know, Tony uh, Judd's, uh, you know, post-war for instance, or uh, uh, Amos Elon's The Pity of It All, but I really delved into the other creative works, the other works of graphic literature in particular, um, they particularly that influenced me coming to this project because I really, like, I I wanted to share that experience of, you know, of of that that reading list that I essentially put together for myself to, to create this project with my readers who, you know, many of which may not be comics fans. I assume that a lot of my readers of this book are going to be like, you know, just maybe Jewish people who are, you know, interested in Holocaust memoirs and, you know, like, you know, new generational perspectives on the matter, um, or, you know, literary people who, uh, you know, just want to dip their toes into graphic lit. But, uh, you know, for me, even though I grew up, you know, obsessed with comics, you know, I had to kind of like a sort of like a side path for the last like 15, 20 years into, into the world of fine arts, uh, and which, which is excellent. But I, uh, I really had to like relearn or kind of like newly learn the field of graphic lit as we know it, which really also kind of like blossomed in the last 20 years or so that, you know, that I've been on, on, uh, on fine arts leave. So one of the things you've been alluding to is this sort of hybrid uh, graphic storytelling and fine arts background that you have. And I know that in recent years, the lines that used to divide these two fields of art have really blurred. How do you see that evolving or have you seen that evolving in your own life as an artist? I mean, yeah, in, in my own life, I have, you know, almost completely transitioned my creative practice to comics. I mean, so like graphic narrative, like that is my my create. I mean, like, you know, with the past five and a half years I've worked on this book, but also just all the ideas and that in my head now when I'm in the studio are all, you know, graphic narratives. So it's, it's had a huge impact on me creatively. I mean, I, I'm used to like kind of like jumping around from medium to medium, idea to idea as a fine artist. I've always had a lot of like 
given myself a lot of creative leeway to to do that. So I I've absolutely never spent this much time working on one single project. It's really I think rewired my brain in a lot of ways, creatively and even just the way I think. I mean, I, I often just kind of like think in like you know story panels. And, uh, and, and so there's something that's just really like, and I'm, I'm, I'm very much at, at first, it was like a very disquieting feeling. Like I, at, at first when I was, I was like, am I really okay with this? Like I define myself so much as this one particular kind of artist, particular kind of maker, but I, I've learned to really just lean into it and, and, and embrace that because I, I found something I love to do. It feels like I'd come by it, honestly, having been a kid obsessed with this medium. And it feels like it's a real kind of like cyclical thing. Like I'm coming back to something that was like the, you know, the, the genesis of my creative, you know, endeavors. And you don't feel that the art snobs are going to look down on you for doing comics. They might. I mean, that's, you know, I like talking about audiences here, you know, I mean, like the, the consumers of adult graphic literature is a very small pie as a very small, small by slice of a pie, as you probably know. And, you know, like I, I have, a you know, most of my friends are still in the like fine arts world. I'm only now just sort of like networking and getting to know folks in the, cartooning and comics world and it's great to to get out there and do that but most of my friends in fine arts as well as in, in literature and journalism my my wife is a, a journalist and author like you know my whole social network is in you know this kind of like art and literary world and like i can probably count on one hand the number of people in those existing circles who regularly read adult graphic it's just like, you know, culturally, it's getting more important and more sort of like understood to be like a, like a real and significant art form. But like in practice, I think there's a lot of catching up to do. Maybe, maybe Gen Z is already there. I mean, a lot of my students, you know, in that, in that demographic are certainly like huge comic fans, but most of them are like, it's like manga, you know, it's like, that's like, like ex explicitly what they're like, they're really about. And um, so, you know, so, but, so, you know, certainly there's definitely going to be the, the folks who are looking down at this like kids medium or whatever, but it's just because of lack of exposure. You know, I think if you, if you, you know, give a, you know, your top five, you know, favorite, you know, books of graphic literature to any, any smart thinking person, they're going to be impressed by what they see there. It's just like the, the bar of entry is a little bit high for some folks. So I don't take it personally. The title of the book alludes to your disconcerting visit to Auschwitz. Could you tell us why that visit was so off-putting? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I didn't expect it to be a pleasant thing. You know, I didn't expect it to be a topic to be on the, you know, using juice and then chat about. Um, but I, I think that my expectations were very different than the reality on the ground. So I expected, you know, going into this, like this, this horrible site of, of just a um, murder and pain and i would felt to, i expected to feel like a really deep kind of connection to that experience almost like a like a, it's almost you know almost like a quasi spiritual kind of a reverential like you know walking into a graveyard sort of feeling but what i found there the couple of things that really like set me off kilter first of which was just like the mass disorganization of the space and just kind of like walking into this like just like chaos you know, like it was like incredibly crowded chaos you know, almost basically really run by the Polish state as like a, it's like a tourist destination. So I think it is like, if I'm not mistaken, the like largest tourist destination as far as like, you know, number of folks who visit like in Poland and uh, run by the state. So that, that was like one piece of it, just that jarringness of coming in, seeing the lines of the, the crowd of people sneaked around and just like having like panicking, trying to find where I'm supposed to be with what different tour or whatever. And then the other part of it was once I got on that tour, the official like English language tour of the, you know, Auschwitz-Birkenau Memorial, um, realizing that the talking points of the tour were so specifically geared toward the non-Jewish Polish suffering at Auschwitz, which is historically clearly was a real phenomenon there and a lot of Poles died and suffered at the camp but proportional to the number of Jews and specifically we're talking about mostly Jewish Poles uh, which was not even you know really part of the conversation how you know like like all these Poles are talking about are like most of them were Jewish um I so that part of it was almost like you know like 
peering through like a, you know, scrim into another reality, you know, someone else's reality, you know, people like, you know, living this reality that, you know, Auschwitz and, and, you know, this part of this large thing in the Holocaust was, was very much centered on someone else's suffering. Uh, but you know, it was, it was idle thing. And, uh, it certainly was not the experience that I wanted, but it was an experience that I needed in order to tell, you know, this story. Cause it really kind of, it, it, it's, you know, it's the point from which, uh, a, a good amount of this, you know, the rest of this book unfolded. Well, I appreciate the skepticism you express regarding inherited trauma. The science around this does seem to be a little bit fuzzy. Yet, your quest to reconstruct your family's story was motivated, as you say, at least in part, by this trauma. Did creating the book help you cope or deepen the wounds or maybe both? The answer is both. Yes, definitely both. I mean, there's so I, I you know, I, I talk about a little bit in the book, this idea of creating visual memory as, you know, almost I don't I don't use the words like art therapy, but it is like an art therapeutic application of art making that you know that that by sort of like you know because I'm, I'm, I'm an artist i'm like a visual person so by almost like visually naming a thing this these stories that have always been bouncing around in my head as a child hearing from my grandparents and my family you know these accounts these horrific accounts like it's you know it's like the monster of the imagination is always going to be greater than the thing that you see it's like the, the, what i always like to think about it was almost like in like kind of old style creature feature horror movies where like you don't see the creature until like at the end of the movie so it's like the it's like the idea of the thing that instills fear that you see it at the end it's almost like a little bit anticlimactic because it's like you know somebody's best job at like you know slap a bunch of mud on a arm was the armature and making the making a monster but you know so so for me you know part of it was being able to you know visualize the, the events of those traumas and, and i think that that did help me it did it did help me when i was trying to kind of uh you know work through or work past some of 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 that you know some some of that inherited trauma um but it, it certainly didn't put it all to rest i mean it's like i'm still living in this reality that i you know that i both grown in that i both born into raised in but also that i kind of created for myself in a visual sense you know with this book so you know it's like a you know it's 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 like a self you know imposed burden in the sense but it's also about being the caretaker of these stories generationally speaking you know it's like my grandparents you know they they wanted to tell these stories my grandparents and great grandparents who wrote their testimonies down who gave interviews who you know sat with the usc show foundation and you know like i like i have like like an amazing amount of information from people who wanted to tell these stories in a public way so you know for me, I, it, it's it really the, the decision to make this book and to tell their stories was to keep those, you know, to keep those stories alive, almost to uh, um, honor their uh, their intentions that they wanted they wanted these these stories to be heard. Now, you know, but back to the you know the idea of uh, you know inherited trauma, what that really is, and it's like you know like yeah, the, the science of it is like a fuzzy thing. It's still like an attractive you know idea, and I know that you know like it's not just. Jews and descendants of Holocaust survivors, it's descendants of lots of historical traumas that kind of like feel like there's something that feels like, you know, like it's like a truth speaking, even if it's not like, you know, like scientifically, like, like there is something that this idea that, that these experiences are passed down at the very, very least it's cultural, right? So you're, it's like, it's it, your, 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 your grandparents, your parents, your, your family passes these, these stories down or these feelings, these emotions down. And that's very real, you know, and I, I don't think that that can be disputed. So, you know, you're living in the reality that's been created by your ancestors. And I'd say, I would, you know, I argue in the book, essentially that, 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 that reality with the Jewish people is one that literally spans back the you know, millennia of Jewish experience, because you just look at, you know, these, uh, you know, this root system as a, in that illustration I made of like the tree, family tree and the, and the roots of history. And, you know, it's just like, ex, you know, massacre after expulsion, after pogrom, after, you know, forced, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, conversion, assimilation. It's like, like, this is a history of trauma. And, you know, to, to pretend like, okay, yeah, but I'm, I'm born into like the privileges of like, you know, like, you know, white, 
Jewish American, you know, whatever, like, like, and, you know, so like that, that doesn't affect me anymore is like, it, it's, it's kind of a naive position to take because like, you know, we are absolutely, um, you know, the results of our, our, of our experiences and our familial experiences. And sure, some of that is probably like somehow like our genetic experience, but, you know, in, in so far as, you know, these same people who have been traumatized over generations are reproducing and like, you know, like passing these traits, whatever they are, you know, to that, those next generations. And, you know, so, so there's something about the idea that even if, you know, I'm, you know, there's something about the idea that is uh, like just appealing or just like kind of sits right. You use the image of a tikkun olamiter referring to the Hebrew concept of tikkun olam or repairing the world. Can you describe this for our audience? Sure. Yeah. I mean, so tikkun olam for anyone who just needs like a primer on the the term is this you know, Jewish premise of uh, a concept of healing the world. So the idea that, you know, that you as an individual have the power to make the world a little bit better in whatever regard you want to, right? So to try to like make life better for yourself, your community, the world in general. And it's just kind of like, a, it's something that I think a lot of especially, you know, kind of contemporary Jews, like, you know, they, they really like look to as like, this is like one of like the really positive, like, you know, you know, guiding principles of, of, of Jewishness and Judaism. Um, and, uh, in, in the book though, yeah. So the, I, I have a chapter called Tikkun Olometer and I come up with this, like invented this make-believe contraption called the Tikkun Olometer through which you can, um, gauge one's, you know, like net positive effect on the world. And, you know, of course that doesn't exist. It's a ridiculous premise, but I use it as a way, you know, actually, I mean, that, that, that chapter is like kind of about like, you know, like all the suffering that my family's had, but also, you know, like all the privilege that we have in the situation. So it's almost like thinking about, uh, you know, like what I can do thinking about this tragic history, you know, of my family and of the Jewish people. And just thinking about how I can then, you know, like re- constitute that into a positive force that I can put into the world to try to, you know, make other people's experiences a little bit better. Like, you know, try, but, you know, I do it in like a tongue in cheek way, because of course that like dovetails so like eagerly into this kind of like, you know, like white savior complex or whatever, this idea that, you know, it's like, well, you know, like I have it well, I have it good. So I'm going to, you know, like, you know, like uh, spread it around, uh, trickle down, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> economics, this thing or something. I even bring up Reagan at one point in that chapter about, you know, this kind of like, um, you know, this uh, like shining city on a hill thing and uh, just uh, um, libertarian, like, uh, you know, like, well, you know, like if you choose to, you can, uh, you know, use your, you know, vast resources or whatever to, to help other people. But yeah, just, uh, you know, the idea that, you know, the tragedy of history doesn't have to just be tragedy. You know, it doesn't have to be something that, 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 that you just ball up and, you know, and swallow down and, or just, you know, like rip your hair out about like, you know, what happened? It's like, what can you, how can you use that to, you know, try to forge a more positive uh, future, you know? And that's, so it's, you know, it, it's, but it's not like a, it, you know, it, it's not like a perfect path, you know, it's, it's uh, and, and of course, you know, it's, 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 everybody can kind of interpret that in their, in their own way, but it's like, a, you know, it's something I do think is, is, is important and is serious. Well, thank you so much, Ari, for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And to our audience, now back to your regularly scheduled lives. Amusing Jews is here to amuse you. If you like being amused, go ahead and click like and subscribe.